Okay. You may proceed. Very well. Uh, Mr. Koppel, you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. I'm with the uh, Department of Justice and I'm representing the United States in this case. The district court erroneously held that the that uh, uh, the United States has a an Indian trust law duty rooted in the Fort Laramie uh, Treaty of 1868 uh, to uh, to provide um, uh, what the, the what the district court characterized as uh, competent physician led uh, health care to members of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. The uh, the court's analysis the court um, failed to uh, uh, recognize the requirements of Indian trust law, which uh, uh, which demand first uh, the existence of a trust corpus. Uh, which is not uh, not uh, satisfied in this case, and second, also a a, uh, a, a specific body of uh, of, of uh, uh, rights creating uh, prescriptions, which also uh, does not exist in this case. Um, the the treaty uh, simply required the United States uh, to provide a a, a single physician. And uh, and a house for that physician, uh, not to exceed the cost of three thousand dollars, and annual pro- appropriations for that physician, as well as uh, uh, se- several other service providers uh, to the entire Sioux Nation. Um, and the uh, 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 that that obligation has been uh, thoroughly fulfilled by the United States uh, to the present day. First. Uh, with uh, uh, through the uh, uh, the treaty, its compliance with the treaty terms itself, and and subsequently after the the federal government enacted the the Snyder Act and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act through the uh, through the Indian Health Service, which provides uh, health services to the entire American Indian and uh, and uh, Alaska Native community. Uh, in excess of uh, two billion dollars a year, with uh, with uh, more than six hundred hospitals and uh, and clinics and uh, thousands of, of uh, doctors and other medical care providers. So uh, it uh, it is clear, uh, particularly under this court's decision in the Yankton Sioux case, that there is no uh, that there is no trust corpus here. Which is a requirement of the Indian uh, trust law doctrine. Um, the, uh, the the trust uh, the corpus would consist. Also, of- I wanted to ask you about Yankton Sioux. I mean, Yankton Sioux does talk about um, a trust corpus, but in the very next sentence, it says, "Nor has Yankton Sioux alleged violation of any statutory or treaty obligation that could be characterized as a breach of trust." Doesn't that mean you can either have a trust corpus in some situations, or you can have a trust obligation that flows from a treaty? And don't we have the latter, arguably, here? Well, Your Honor, uh, certainly we read those two requ- uh, requirements as being in conjunction. That there, that there has to, both requirements have to be met. There has to be a trust corpus, as well as the uh, uh, as well as the rights creating uh, body of law, and that's why that that's why. Um, uh, the court uh, used the used the term "nor" as the as the connector, um, but to the extent that there that uh, it, um, certainly a treaty can give rise to uh, to um, to obligations, um, and in theory, a treaty can also um, give rise to to uh, to trust obligations. But do you agree that there's a general trust obligation toward the tribes um, that the federal government owes? There, Your Honor, there is a general trust law obligation, but again, that is that is different from a a common law a, a common law trust obligation, which is what the uh, the plaintiffs are suing under, and what the what uh, the Supreme Court's and this court's cases over the last forty years since the Mitchell cases have have really have addressed uh, and developed. The, uh, it, it's clear that for a common law um, uh, trust obligation to exist, um, there, there, there does have to be a trust corpus. It's not enough that it be a, 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 
a limited or bare trust, as this, as this, uh, the Supreme Court and and uh, this court have repeatedly uh, characterized it. There must be um, assets. There must be Indian property that is being managed uh, by the United States on behalf of the Indians. Then, in addition to that, there also has to be um, rights creating. Um, uh, a rights-creating body of law, be it uh, statutory, uh, regulatory, or treaty. Um, now here, there's no, it, neither of the, the requirements of trust law are, are, uh, are satisfied. Um, because the, uh, the, uh, the um, first, there, there's no trust corpus. And in that respect, I, again, I would turn to, to Yank and Sue, which is very, Revealing because that case also invo involved uh, a Sioux tribe, which was a signatory to this to this treaty, and um, and it involved the closure of an emergency room, as this one did. And there, the court held that neither of the the uh, the, the prongs of trust, trust doctrine uh, had been satisfied. Um, so. Uh, um, Um, uh, that is the that's really the um, the the crux of the uh, of the dispute here, and um, uh, I, uh, we, there is also the the additional problem with the with the with the district court's declaratory judgment, which is an which is an advisory opinion, but. The, the court need not address that um, it, it, that uh, um, if it if it um, agrees with the government that the that um, the requirements of, of uh, Indian trust law are not satisfied here. So uh, unless there unless there are further questions at this point, I would reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. Well, I do have one. If, if you look at the language that was used in the Yankton Sioux tribe case, one of the things that is apparent in that language is that uh, the tribe failed to allege uh, that there was any statutory or treaty obligation that could be characterized as a breach of trust or a fiduciary duty. And here, obviously, that is specifically alleged. Does the allegation uh, make any difference at all in, in your analysis? Well, no, Your Honor, it doesn't because the the uh, the treaty the treaty clearly does not give rise to uh, to um, a, a trust obligation um, under under the under the terms of the of uh, relevant and controlling uh, Supreme Court and Eighth Circuit precedent. It's just there there was a treaty there there is a treaty obligation um, which was very specific. Um, and and uh, yeah, and it was fully satisfied by by the United States, as I as I stated initially, by complying with the with those specific terms, and subsequently by creating a, a vast uh, uh, yeah, Indian health uh, care system, which is which uh, encompasses the the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and the entire Sioux Nation, as well as the entire. Um, 2.6 million, approximately, uh, American Indian and and Native Alaskan community. So uh, the uh, the trust the trust obligation here simply does not uh, it cannot give rise to a uh, to uh, to a, a uh, uh, the treaty obligation cannot give rise to a a trust law duty as that has been defined uh, in in uh, the applicable case law. Um, so I, again, unless there are further questions, I would uh, I would uh, reserve the balance of my time. All right, very well, uh, Mr. Billion. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Tim Billion from Robbins Kaplan, uh, arguing on behalf of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. In 1868, the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, along with other tribes, entered into the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the United States. Along with a cessation of hostilities, the United States acquired vast territories of land in that treaty. And in exchange, the United States made a number of promises, including the promise at issue in this case. 
I'm not going to spend my time today rehashing the tragic state of healthcare on the Rosebud Reservation. I, I think the three volume appendix here thoroughly documents those facts. And, and indeed, much of that evidence comes from the federal government itself. Instead, this case has focused on three narrow legal issues the government has offered to avoid its treaty and statutory promise. And, and we heard uh, my, my colleague talk primarily about one, the trust corpus issue. There's also the scope of the treaty duty and the issue of redressability. I'll go through each of those, but ultimately, I think each issue comes back to the same central theme. A party to a treaty with the federal government can get a declaration of its rights in federal court. <clears throat> Turning first to the uh, trust corpus issue, um, you know, Judge Erickson and Judge Kobus, you both brought up uh, language in the Yankton Sioux decision that I think is, is very important and, and telling. Um, that case uh, primarily involved whether the government complied with certain statutory uh, consultation obligations prior to changing services. It changed an emergency department to an urgent care clinic. That's not what we have here. Um, and, and furthermore, the primary basis for the holding in Yankton Sioux was, uh, was preclusion. That's also not an issue here. The only extent to which the court in Yankton Sioux addressed the trust or treaty issue was in the very final paragraph of that opinion. And the court simply noted that uh, the tribe hadn't alleged a specific violation and that its vague assertions were not actionable. But uh, I believe as Judge Erickson, as you noted, by contrast here, we have alleged specific treaty and statutory violations. And as Judge Kobus picked up on, the opinion distinguishes between trust obligations where the government manages resources and, and where you may need a trust corpus, and then a violation of a statutory or treaty obligation. That's at page 644 of the opinion. And all of that supports the idea that a trust duty can and often does exist where it's created by a treaty or by a statute, and that's separate and independent from the existence of any resources managed by the government. There's no reason to read those requirements conjunctively. I would point the court especially to the White v. Califano case where uh, the, the court there did find a, a statutory trust duty based on the same statutes that are at issue here. And it didn't look to a trust corpus issue, it just looked to the statutes. So I, I think that's really instructive as to the point that these are not conjunctive duties. Um, and this furthermore, it's, it's not a bare trust like, uh, like was at issue in Mitchell where the government was simply managing timber resources to prevent their alienation. Here uh, we, have, we have affirmative commitments both in the treaty and in numerous subsequent statutes um, that, that provide obligations to provide health care. I'd like to talk next a little bit about standing and redressability. Uh, at its core, there's nothing unusual about this lawsuit. Uh, parties ask for courts to interpret documents all the time, be they insurance contracts or statutes or treaties, and courts then define the rights and responsibilities of the parties, and, and that can even be done prospectively before a breach occurs. The district court's opinion here was not an advisory opinion simply because it wasn't based on hypothetical facts. The facts here are very real and very well documented and very tragic. I point the court to uh, joint appendix at page 773 for just one among many examples. I'm gonna quote, the impacts of these deficiencies are not theoretical. These persistent failures have led to unnecessary suffering by patients, by families, and by whole communities. In fact, they have led to multiple patient deaths, close quote. Again, that's just one example from the undisputed evidence, and that comes from the federal government itself. So this lawsuit is not an advisory opinion about events that may hypothetically occur in the future. It's about what already happened. The care the government was providing at the Rosebud Hospital was so poor that it constituted an immediate danger to patients and the public and resulted in the facility being shut down. I would also point out that the relief granted here is sufficiently specific and conclusive to redress the treaty interpretation issue. The district court here didn't need to solve every problem with IHS or micromanage its budget. It needed to construe the treaty and its decision is authoritative and conclusive as to what the treaty requires. Um, here I would uh, point the court to page 560 in the White v. Califano opinion, 
where it says, quote, a declaratory judgment will serve the vital purpose of defining rights and responsibilities in the area of Indian health care. And that's exactly what we need here. The district court's judgment has real meaning. Simply the confirmation that health care is not a gratuitous appropriation that's benevolently conferred upon the tribe, but it's instead a treaty right given in exchange for peace and land, that's momentous. And this declaration, it won't solve every problem with IHS, but it will directly and conclusively solve one major harm. The harm that the government doesn't recognize that it has a treaty obligation to provide adequate health care to the tribe. And judicial confirmation of that right allows the tribe to hold political actors accountable when they fail to live up to those promises. I do want to talk uh, in my remaining time about the scope of the treaty obligation. And I'll start by observing that the district court properly recognized the the liberal canons of construction that, that favor the tribe. Treaties are construed in favor of the tribes and the terms are interpreted as the as the Indians would have understood them themselves. So here, the treaty required the government to provide a physician, provide a house for the physician, and provide sufficient funds annually to employ the physician. So when we look at the language of the treaty itself, Providing the annual employment of the physician means committing to provide care. And it's reasonable for the district court to infer the Indians signing the treaty would have understood that care from a physician be competent. I would also note, as the district court noted in footnote two of its opinion, and again referenced in footnote 10 of its opinion, that when you look at the treaty itself, the tribal signatories signed their name with an X. They couldn't read English and this treaty was written down in English. That's precisely one of the reasons that courts apply the liberal canons of construction in favor of tribes. Counsel, I mean, the text of the treaty still has a physician, it's singular. And there are other instances where, um, I forget if there are multiple blacksmiths, but certainly teachers, um, the, the the treaty specifically contemplates more than one. I mean, isn't that just on the face of the treaty a difference and jumping to, I mean, it may be that a competent physician can be implied from the treaty, but competent health care seems to me to be a different sort of a leap as opposed to the one that you've, that, well, in my view, potentially different than the, uh, than the conclusion the district court reached here. Yes, and, and I, uh, the court's right that it, uh, the treaty talks about multiple uh, teachers. Um, And then there were other singulars, I believe a blacksmith and a miller uh, and and the physician. Um, Education was was treated as a separate subject in this in this treaty. There were actually uh, a number of different sections talking about um, when you needed to expand uh, and provide more teachers, how, for example, the United States could withdraw a physician after 10 years, but had to provide additional funding for education. So I think that because of the different treatment between education and health care, that um, th- th- there's not a, a direct parallel there that the court can use to, um, to, to so limit the health care obligation. Uh, well, but how, about the, thought- how about the other obligations? For example, I think there's a miller that was required to be provided. Under the district court's interpretation of the treaty, is there an ongoing trust obligation or treaty obligation under the government, for example, to provide uh, grain production facilities for the tribe? Uh, doesn't the same logic, understandably healthcare is a critical need, but under the interpretation of the, of the treaty, why doesn't that fly too? Why doesn't the trust obligation extend to the other professionals? I think the best answer to that question, Your Honor, is because um, I, First of all, there's been no evidence that uh, uh, the government, you know, withdrew uh, from from healthcare as it could have under the treaty. It didn't do that. The district court specifically noted that. I don't know uh, whether the the federal government has specifically withdrawn the Miller or specifically withdrawn the blacksmith. That was never presented to the district court, so so we just don't have that information in the record. So, do I think that we could declare those duties also extended on this record? No, we couldn't. Um, but the key difference with health care is that not only is it in this treaty from 1868, but it's subsequently recognized in statute after statute after statute. And not just to provide a single physician, but to provide health care. 
doesn't that indicate simply that the government went beyond its treaty obligations? And doesn't the Lincoln case suggest that those sorts of general statutes cannot impose trust or treaty obligations on the federal government? No, Your Honor, I, I would frame it a little differently. I think that those statutes reflect how one party to the treaty understands its obligation. And so they are not merely gratuitous appropriations on top of a single physician that they all. The problem with that is the party, the other party of the treaty is here suggesting that they don't understand it that way. Well, the other party to the treaty, um, in the sense of, of, of arguing this lawsuit, is taking one position. But I would argue that the Congress of the United States has taken a much different position. And we've seen that in report after report after report and study after study and hearing after hearing where Congress has reaffirmed its obligation to provide this health care. And I would also point out, Your Honor, that- Well, uh, hold separate- on, wait a minute. I mean, um, if you think about, about what that means, is that that's got to mean that somehow there's a treaty obligation plus, and that plus has to come from, you know, uh, probably its origins would be in the Snyder Act, right? And then the subsequent uh, Indian Health Act, right? And we're going to run right smack up into the reasoning of what the Ninth Circuit said, that those don't create uh, an enforceable trust obligation at that point, right? I mean, and so the question I've got is that how do we move beyond uh, the plain meaning of the treaty language itself to find some other obligation that's broader, right? The, 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 the obligation that the district court found here, uh, uh, physician-led competent health care, right? How do you get there? Um, and, and I'm just, that's why, you know, as I struggle with the, with the analysis, that's the piece I'm looking at, because I'm thinking that, you know, you can look at the Snyder Act, you can look at the Indian Health Service as it's been managed and run, but we have a case law that's floating around out there that says that, 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 uh, that those are not uh, sufficient to create this kind of an obligation. So your obligation has to reside somewhere in the Fort Laramie Treaty, and how do you move beyond the plain language? Sure. Well, I think that, um, you know, the court's question leads me to to what my next point was going to be, which is that there's the treaty and the treaty exists and provides, you know, an an obligation. Right. There is an obligation there, whatever it may be. There's also uh, a a series of statutes, the Snyder Act, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act and later the Affordable Care Act. Um, And those statutes, I I actually I do believe those create an independent duty. And I think that um, that's the holding that comes out of the White v. Califano case. Now, uh, I assume, Judge Erickson, your question about the Ninth Circuit was relating to the to the Ketchum decision, if I'm if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and, you know, Your Honor, that was an unpublished single page decision um, where the court rejected a, a fiduciary duty claim based solely on the acts. Um, and, and I think it's distinguishable here for a number of reasons. First, we do have a treaty. Um, and those treaties, the, the interpretation of that treaty, rather, is informed by the subsequent passage of, of, uh, of the statutes that evidence Congress's understanding of its obligation to provide health care that first arose in the treaty. Um, and finally, I would say, Your Honor, to the extent that the Ninth Circuit decision conflicts with White, uh, this court needs to follow uh, White v. Califano, which is, an, you know, ultimately was an Eighth Circuit decision where the Eighth Circuit adopted the reasoning of the district court um, and, and found that those same statutes, the Snyder Act and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, uh, did create a trust responsibility. So, uh, hearing no further questions, I've uh, uh, run under a minute here on my time, so I will just briefly conclude. Um, the federal government made promises to the tribe, and the tribe is entitled to have a federal court construe and declare the rights and obligations of the parties of the treaty. And if the federal government's trust responsibilities can't be adjudicated in a federal court, then where? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Billion. Uh, Mr. Koppel, your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I don't have a great deal to add to to the uh, the points that were made by uh, by judges uh, Kobas and Erickson. Um, I would just I, I would emphasize that what the what the plaintiff is trying to do here is to graft onto very specific treaty obligations 
a a a a, a, a broad and vague uh, Indian trust law duty that simply does not exist. Uh, the, uh, the 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 Indian canon is not applicable here because the parties would not have they would not have understood it. Neither the United States nor uh, the or nor the the uh, the Sioux tribes would have understood it to involve a a healthcare system, which the term healthcare is not even used in the in the treaty. Uh, it simply refers to a physician um, and. The uh, the, the uh, um, uh, um, additional statutory obligations the, uh, that uh, uh, in the in the Snyder Act and the uh, and and uh, uh, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act are simply a broad and aspirational statements as the district court recognized and they cannot they do not uh, give rise to to a trust law duty, and the district court even uh, even recognized that it was just deciding this case on the basis of the treaty claim uh, that, that the treaty gave rise to uh, um, to the this trust law duty. So the uh, the, um, the plaintiff's reliance on White versus Califano is also is is. Uh, uh, misplaced because, as we showed in our briefs, I mean, White is really at this point, uh, uh, whatever its status is, good law. It is certainly inconsistent uh, with uh, the last 40 years of, uh, of decisions uh, from the Supreme Court, and also decisions from this court in cases like uh, Yankton Sioux and, and Ashley, um, which make clear that that is not the the mode of analysis. That uh, that um, should be employed in in uh, in Indian trust in the Indian trust law area. Um, so again, the, and as for uh, the the, the uh, it's also significant that that uh, the that um, the, the the treaty involved other uh, other uh, service providers such as millers, blacksmiths, teachers, etc. Um, so to to say that to to extrapolate from from the language providing a physician and a physician's house and and appropriations uh, for uh, uh, annual appropriations for physicians uh, to a physician to provide services um, that, they, that 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 somehow uh, creates a a uh, broad uh, duty to provide uh, uh, health care a health care system which is what is really um, uh, what the what uh, the plaintiffs and the district court are driving at simply is not it, it is not valid. Um, so, uh, if there so, are no uh, uh, is it the position of the of the United States then that um, looking solely at the treaty, uh, just assume for a minute that we we take an approach. We're going to take an approach of looking at obligations under the treaty. Is it the position of the United States that its obligation under the treaty uh, in 2021 is to provide one physician and a house um, at a cost of not to exceed $3,000? Well, Your Honor, uh, certainly the, the United States is providing infinitely more than that through through the statutory discretionary statutory programs. But those fully those fully satisfy any obligation created by the treaty. The treaty, of course, by its terms, which is uh, as the parties understood in 1868, and that is the relevant time, um, required only a single physician and the physician's house. Uh, and and uh, appropriations for the entire Sioux Nation, and uh, so there is no, there, there can be no, um, th there can be no doubt that the United States is fully satisfying the requirements of the treaty uh, now, as it has all along through the through uh, the uh, the vast Indian uh, health care network that uh, that Congress has provided. Now, if Congress were were to uh, to revoke that and to uh, and and to eliminate uh, the the Indian Health Service, then perhaps plaintiffs could uh, could bring a claim if there if there's no if if uh, no 
if they're not uh, receiving any medical services. But that obviously is a far cry from what has happened here. Uh, there's no uh, the what the plaintiffs are doing is saying that because they are dissatisfied with services at the at uh, at the Rosebud uh, Hospital, um, the United States has violated a a, a a duty under Indian trust law um, that uh, that can be enforced through a very vague and and uh, um, and, and uh, uh, abstract declaratory judgment and there it doesn't even it doesn't resolve any specific uh, concrete dispute between the parties uh, so th this is just an open-ended uh, claim to uh, to create um, a, a, a an obligation a permanent obligation uh, under the uh, the treaty to uh, uh, to uh, provide a, a, a general health care system and that's not what the treaty did so if the if there are no further questions, I would uh, urge the court to reverse the the judgment of the district court. All right. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. The court will render a decision in due course.